Hi, I'm Jakub Jankton. Like everybody else, I have my strengths. I have my weaknesses. I have a family. I have my friends. I have a job, which I have been doing it as best as I can for years. With seriousness, professionalism, and passion. Like everybody else, I also want to live my life in freedom, without fears, without prejudice, without violence, but with love. I'm homosexual, and I no longer want to hide myself. For more on this, let's bring in Jim Dolan. He's the founder of Pride of Irons. That's the official LGBTQIA supporters group at the English Premiership Club West Ham. Mr. Dolan, welcome to the day. Uh, tell me, how important is Jakob Yankto's announcement? Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I think it's very important because it's another contributing factor to show that the tide has truly turned on this issue. You know, we've seen a number of uh, people around the football industry coming out, you know, over the years, referees and officials. Then we had Josh Cavallio come out. We had uh, Jake Daniels, Zander Murray. And I think now we're seeing that more and more people feel comfortable. I think every person who comes along sets another boundary in terms of creating a safe environment, making people realise that, you know, the other side isn't perhaps as bad as they first thought. And hopefully we're leading towards a place where, you know, th these announcements won't happen because actually it will become accepted. That's where we all want to get to. We all want to stop talking about this issue. But I think we just have to get over the first kind of couple of hurdles and we're well on our way. Exactly. What does it tell us about the culture that persists in football that Jakub Yankto felt the need to come out the way he did and that we're reporting it as news? I mean, I, I feel for what he said because it's it, it struck a chord with me that I just want to live my life. You know, uh, and he talked about being a professional. He talked about, you know, not, not having to hide. And there's always part of you, no matter what profession you're in, that if you're not out, if you are hiding that part of yourself, you can't be 100%. You can't be 100% in your job. You can't give 100% to, of, to yourself because there's always part of your energy that's committed to hiding a truth. So I think, you know, he, he had to kind of do that announcement. I think a lot of people in that position feel like they have to make these announcements because I think they need to prepare the public, uh, you know, give them that heads up before they come out and say, you know, I'm, I'm now comfortable in myself and I want you to be comfortable with it too. Now, football is the biggest sport in Europe and has a very small number of openly gay male players. Why is that? I, I just think it's, it's, it's become such an issue over the years. I think it's taken you know, these, these brave people to, to step forward and, and make those first tentative steps. And hopefully what they show is that actually it's it's not the, the, the problem that, that people thought, perhaps the, you know, the, the reactions people are getting on the whole, I think, are more positive. And like I say, I think it is setting a precedent. Um, I think maybe there's the, the culture of, of football is often seen as the, the culture of society, but through a magnifying glass. And I think sometimes some of the societal problems we have can seem exaggerated. But communities like ours, when you get under the surface and you start speaking to your average everyday football supporter, you find that most people don't care about this kind of thing. You know, I think it's one of those problems where, you know, the, the, there's a loud minority perhaps, but actually the majority of people go with, you know, what, what Yako said there, you know, just let people live their lives. Yeah. You say the tide has turned. Um, how entrenched is toxic masculinity and homophobia in today's football culture from the stands all the way to club owners and organizations like FIFA, for example? I don't know about explicit homophobia. I think it's actually a lot more insidious and subtle. Um, you know, you don't hear as many explicit homophobic chants as you used to, but there are people pushing back on some of the things that, you know, people do raise. There's a chant that's you know, often used about Chelsea that people um, don't agree as homophobic. And I think it's become a bit of public discourse around that. But I think on the whole, um, it's one of those, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, Often it seems like there's a bigger problem than there is because unfortunately there's this psychological aspect to football where you know people start singing a song, other people join in. And if you're a gay player and a song comes out, a chant that has a, a homophobic um, edge to it, you know, that's going to amplify the perception of the problem. Um, I do think it's a hurdle, it's an image problem that football needs to get over. But like I say, I think underneath the surface, the culture of football, the culture of football supporters 
I don't think is intrinsically homophobic, but I do think we need a culture shift. Tim Dolan, he's working for that culture shift as the founder of Pride of Irons, the official LGBTQIA supporters group at West Ham in England. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.